It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Morris to present today at Medicine Grand Rounds. Dr. Morris is an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and clinically practices at Harborview Valley and the University of Washington Emergency Departments. Dr. Morris obtained his medical degree from the University of Washington and then completed his health staff training at Yale. He then completed a fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital with a focus in international emergency medicine and obtained a master's in public health with a focus in global health. Dr. Morris's clinical and research interests are in global health with a focus in disaster medicine and health systems development. He has clinically practiced in multiple settings in multiple disaster situations on several continents. He is a current active member of the U.S. Department of Health's Washington State Disaster Medical Assistance Team and serves on the City of Seattle Disaster Management Committee and the UWMC Disaster Committee. Today, Dr. Morris will be presenting Disaster Medicine Lessons from Hurricanes Harvey and Maria. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Morris. Thank you so much. Um, it's quite an honor for me to be here. Um, it was just about 20 years ago today, or 20 years ago this summer, that um, I started walking across the Montlake Bridge um, as I started my post-baccalaureate uh, work here at University of Washington with the intent of practicing clinical and clinical medicine and public health. So it's quite apropos that I'm here uh, at this reunion. So um, I'm going to go through a few academic uh, concepts prior to talking about um, the overview of the response uh, to the recent hurricanes and the lessons learned. In particular, I'm going to discuss how the interaction between disaster medicine, clinical medicine, and, um, uh, and emergency management is a little bit unfocused, and, and we could benefit from working on that. I'll define disaster man management and talk about its core principles. And then um, I'll go through the federal disaster, a domestic disaster response with an emphasis on clinical medicine. Um, and then finally, I'll touch on the, very briefly on the pathology of disaster medicine, which is quite a large field. And then I'll discuss the hurricanes and, and some lessons learned. So I'm a triple employee. I work for the University of Washington, the Department of Health and Human Services in the VA. Uh, uh, so I um, have kind of a disclosure. So this is a United Nations uh, definition of disaster. Um, I'll let you read it. But I, uh, I like this uh, because it's really a holistic um, definition. It talks about the disruption of functioning at multiple levels of society. And when you think about any disaster that's, that's going to affect any of the human, material, economic, or environmental uh, parts of the workings of society, it's going to affect the others as well. You can't have an economic, um, economic disaster without having human impacts, and you can't have a humanitarian disaster without having economic impacts. With regards to disaster medicine and emergency management, these are two fields that are really overlapping, um, but they often ignore each other. So as clinical medicine is difficult to master without an understanding of population and public health, at the same time, disaster medicine requires a significant understanding of emergency management. So who, who does emergency management? Really, any large organization has a significant emergency management component. So we as a hospital have an emergency management component. We as a city, as a state, um, and then all the other entities. It's a holistic thing. You cannot have emergency management if you leave out the transportation section sector, the, the education sector. And then certainly um, at, the, um, at the level of, uh, of the private sector, um, they rely on emergency management as well. And, and we sometimes have lessons that we can learn in the public sector from the private sector. The core principles of emergency management, it's intended to be comprehensive, which is an all hazards approach. Many of you might have heard that term. Um, it came from the 70s uh, disaster management development uh, or emergency management development. It doesn't mean that we have a plan for every potential disaster. What it means is that our plans are designed in a way to be flexible uh, so that they can respond to different disasters that, that have different components. It's progressive. Um, it's better to act before there's a problem. It's risk-driven. So particularly in a place like Washington State, our emergency <laughs> management and our disaster management plans um, are very focused on what we know is going to happen in Washington State and what our risks are. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
It's integrated, so we go from the level of ind individual all the way through to the top of government. We are collaborative, we include everybody, including the private sector. Um, coordinated, we try and promote good education. And then professional, right? And that's part of what we're talking about today, lessons learned. How can we move the field forward and learn from the um, mistakes that we may have made or the things that we did well? Interestingly enough, when you think about clinical medicine, there's a lot of overlap here. A lot of these same principles that, that, um, that we are doing in, in disaster medicine and, and emergency management um, are the same principles that, call, that we, we rely on within our daily practice of clinical medicine. So this is a picture of a, of a camp, um, a field hospital. I was the medical director of a field hospital in Haiti after the earthquake. It was a 1,200 cot field hospital, although we didn't have cots for everyone. Um, and I put it up there because emergency management is a, is a mission and, and or a vision and a mission-driven entity, um, just like medicine, just like clinical medicine. And that has both positives and negatives. You get really passionate people um, and people really want to do the right thing, but at the same time, they can be distracted by their, their mission and, and their vision. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, so <clears throat> disasters are predictable, and people always think, oh, it's a disaster, it's totally unpredictable. That's not the case. There are many particular, there are many things that are predictable within the field of disaster medicine. So predictable things are people are going to resist training, right? People are not going to want to uh, come out and, and work for something that's nebulous and in the future. Preparing for the unknown is challenging, right? I mean, how do you prepare for what you're, you're not understanding? Um, if you don't know already, um, an earthquake will destroy Seattle. It's a predictable thing. Hopefully it will happen um, long after we understand earthquakes better. We know that hurricanes are going to hit the East Coast in the fall, and we have a large body of data about what injury patterns are after a particular event. However, on the other side, there are a lot of unpredictable things. We don't know the timing and we don't know the intensity of natural disasters. It's completely unpredictable. Um, as we have seen um, over the course of the last decades, um, terrorism is particularly unpredictable um, and on the rise. We know that both both natural disasters and terrorist acts um, have greatly increased in terms of their effect on populations. We also can't, can't um, know the actual structural uh, or equipment failure that you're going to see in an event. Um, it can be partially predicted, but not totally predicted. One thing in particular that we definitely can predict uh, about disasters is we can predict the overall cycle. So every disaster pattern uh, or event is going to have follow the same pattern. So if we start at the actual event, um, we're sort of missing that you really need to start back here at the planning. So we need to do planning for everything. And, um, and luckily now, entities such as hospitals are required to do this. Then an event occurs, we have this response phase, which is what I'm going to talk about when I discuss lessons learned at the end of the lecture. Then we have recovery. How do we get the system back to its normal level of functioning, be it a hospital or, uh, or a government um, or the private sector? Finally, we figure out, okay, what can we do to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've made in the past? And how can we make the, the system more resilient and, more, and stronger? Um, how can we mitigate? Um, and then finally, we're back into the preparation phase where we go ahead and we start practicing. Healthcare has a specific role when it comes to disasters that's a bit of an expansion from the role that it plays um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, our goal, our main goal is to save lives and mitigate injury due to disaster, but we have a larger role with regards to mental health issues that are triggered by the disaster. We always talk um, within the community that if somebody has chronic back pain, it's not going to get better when their house is destroyed, right? It's only going to get worse. Um, so you need to be prepared for that. Hospitals often take over the primary care role uh, when, when uh, there's an event. Um, they're quicker to respond and they're usually more resilient. Hospitals also represent a beacon of hope. So people come to the hospital thinking that it's a way to get, get information and access social services. 
So it expands, particularly when you think of like how social work responds um, in an event. It needs to expand to accommodate that. And hospitals often, re uh, healthcare in general and hospitals in particular, often require uh, external support, um, be this a regional support or a national support or an international support to maintain their functioning. Healthcare workers in particular and healthcare in particular have this quadruple hit. My house in Seattle is as likely to be damaged and I'm as likely to be injured as anyone else in the community. So I can, I'm going to be affected, right? So as a healthcare worker. However, immediately afterwards, I'm now torn. I'm torn between my responsibilities to my patients, the oath that I've taken and, and my responsibility to my community. Um, and my responsibility to my family. So I'm in this, this awful no-win situation. Additionally, predictably, there's an increase in population health needs, right? And it's often volume and acuity. So when we go back one slide, right, um, uh, you know, um, mental health issues, um, actually, I think, yeah, you know, and the back pain, it's not going to get better. So people that, that have chronic problems are going to present more frequently in, a, in the event of a disaster. Facilities as well may be damaged, and then supplies may be limited. So as everybody knows, um, that, that deals with uh, the larger uh, interactions of, of health systems, um, much of the United States is a move to a just-in-time delivery system. We don't keep things stockpiled. It's economically unfeasible in this market. So our gloves and our normal saline and all of the things that we need are delivered on a, on a daily basis. Well, you can imagine if you disrupt the transportation system, we're now in, in kind of a, a pinch for getting those things that we require on a daily basis, predictable. And we have some mitigation for that. We have contracts that you know were preferred uh, provider and things like that, but undoubtedly there's gonna be a limit to supplies. So switching phases a little bit here. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the core concepts. I talked about the core concepts that that um, that uh, emergency management are built around. Now I'm going to talk about the core concepts uh, with regards to disaster medicine. So with regards to the clinical aspects of disaster medicine, it takes a lot of different, a lot of understanding outside of clinical medicine. You need to have a, an understanding of things like ethics, um, obviously, um, you can imagine this is a, a fraught, uh, ethically fraught situation. Um, I've been in situations where we've had discussions where the population we're serving doesn't have access to food. Do we as providers, you know, what, what's, our, what's our responsibility there, you know, because we have our food with us. Um, so it's, it's good to have those, that background when you're going into this. Principles of triage and surge capacity, which in the emergency room we deal with all the time. So you can see how there's a nice sort of overlap in, um, in many of these things uh, uh, with regards to emergency medicine that I practice in disaster medicine. This concept of maximizing the benefit, so population-based health, and we deal with this also in the emergency department when we think about mass casualty events, which occur um, frequently all over the country um, and can be horrific, as we saw in, um, in Las Vegas this last year. Um, so, uh, so understanding that doing the, the best for the most is, is a, a change of paradigm that occurs in these events. Safety, most people work in a, in a clinically safe environment. Um, emergency department is often unfortunately not safe, but I think with our, our change and the increase in terrorism and, and all the gun violence that we've had, it makes really any, any clinical work environment unsafe. So having basic concepts of how to respond safely and, and how to ensure your safety as a provider um, is a big piece of it. Um, the, I spoke about the emergency management and response systems. There's a significant need to understand health systems um, and the interaction between the different portions of the health system. Um, and then finally, uh, a background in the theory uh, of, of risk, threat, and hazard, um, and mitigation. So the fundamentals of, of emergency management. So um, this is Dr. Sachita Shaw, who happens to be here, luckily, today. Um, I put this slide up, and this is, um, this is the sign down in Puerto Rico um, at the emergency department. I put this slide up because there's this 
uh, important aspect when we drill and when we practice for our mass casualty incidents and, and our, um, uh, our uh, disaster response. Um, so this is Dr. Shaw at about eight in the morning after she finished her overnight shift at six. There was an unplanned drill and of course, she stayed late. Why? Because if it were an actual event, of course she would stay late. So that kind of realism, um, although it's taxing um, to the system, is necessary to make it as, as realistic as possible. Finishing up on some other core disaster medicine concepts, um, aspects of law, certainly a good strong understanding of behavioral health and how people respond to stress. Um, planning, healthcare systems I mentioned, training and disaster education. Um, this is a, a very large field um, and you can imagine that there are some elements of society that play key roles in this, such as fire department and, um, uh, you know, and the military. Um, uh, so it's an important to have that background as a provider. Um, the concepts of how do you prepare? How do you set your system up to be resilient in an event of this? Um, emergency medicine, obviously, because we, we, the clinical aspects of some of these, um, such as de de decontamination, are, are part and parcel of what we do on a daily basis. Epidemiology of disasters and pandemics. And then the consequences of particular disasters, which I'll talk about um, uh, very briefly. So again, what we're doing here today when we, when we review what's happened in an event um, and try and learn from it, um, we, uh, we grow and we, and we improve. So this is a poster from uh, the, the pandemic, flu pandemic, which we're still learning about, you know, 100 years later as we go through the epidemiology and they ana analyze the actual viruses uh, with new technologies. So there's really no end to the the understanding of this field and, and opportunities to make it better. Okay, changing gears here for a second, I'm gonna talk about the federal disaster, federal domestic disaster response. And um, in trying to, uh, to organize my slides, I realized that it's kind of a stepwise process. And so I was thinking that I could say, well, imagine you're going up a pyramid one notch at a time. And then I thought, well, that analogy is pretty exhausting, climbing a pyramid. So if you flip the pyramid upside down and, and you imagine that we're going from the top down one notch each time to the bottom where, where you as a clinical provider sit on that last stone of the pyramid, that's what we're going to go through on our next few slides. Anybody know what this is? So this is Fukushima. Um, uh, after the earthquake, these are, um, these are like 55 gallon size bags. You can see that they're being lifted, um, filled with, um, with radioactive waste. And this is a ever expanding, um, uh, field that will continue on at least in our lifetimes. Um, and I put this slide up to say that our consequences and of our, the consequences of our actions are sometimes quite unpredictable. So in Fukushima, there were nine deaths related to the evacuation. And so that decision to evacuate the town um, was one that, that was taken um, uh, in a moment of crisis, but unfortunately had untoward consequences. So there's a lot of responsibility with making these decisions. So this is one of the classic pictures from Hurricane Harvey, just to put it in perspective. Um, this, the area of flooding was the size of uh, Lake Michigan, 22,400 square miles. So just a tremendous amount uh, of space involved. So again, that pyramid. So we'll talk about the national response. This is really an alphabet soup of acronyms. I apologize, um, but we'll try and go through it in a, in a stepwise fashion. It's good to remind people that states have the ultimate authority in our system. So the states have to request the federal government. There's a bit of a misnomer, I think, at the level of, uh, of the public that when there's an event, um, when there's a, a infectious disease event that the CDC is just gonna fly in and fix the problem, 
And when there's a hurricane, the, the military is just going to fly in their federal response. It's not actually that way. The state has to, um, the state has to request federal help and still ultimately retains control of what the federal government is doing on their land. And you can imagine in a place like Texas, um, which has a very sort of free minded spirit, there's, there can be a little bit of conflict, uh, there. So um, with regards to the overall national response, there's a mix of both governmental and non-governmental groups. Um, I'm not going to discuss the non-governmental groups, but it is a very robust response that these groups have. So people like the, the Red Cross, um, local, um, local uh, organizations and social uh, civic society um, can have a big impact. Additionally, at the level of, um, of, the, of a local, regional, and, and state, we have these mutual aid agreements. Um, and this is what allows the police and the fire and the, you know, the power companies um, to respond and help out in the event of, of a disaster. And we, within the, the medical, uh, medical side of things, we also have these mutual aids, aid organizations. And here in Washington State, we have a, um, an organization called the Northwest Healthcare Response Network, which is a, uh, a public health entity that does nothing but work on training and preparation for disasters. It's paid for by all of the hospitals in the state, um, and they all participate. So although we're competing with other hospital systems at the level of, uh, of emergency management and at the level of the executive management, the different hospital systems are sitting down and talking and planning as a unit with regards to disaster. So it's, it's very nice that, uh, that we're able to do that. So starting at the top, FEMA is the head of the national uh, response system. It was started in 1978. And you can see that it, the, the plan, FEMA's mission is, I'll read it, is to support our citizens and first responders to ensure that as a nation, we work together to build, sustain, and improve our capacity to prepare for protect against and respond to and recover from and mitigate all hazards. So a very holistic um, uh, approach. Within FEMA, um, there's five national frameworks. These address the five uh, parts of the cycle of disaster that we know is the predictable part, more or less. Um, so that's prevention, protection, mitigation, response and recovery. You can imagine Recovery goes right back to prevention uh, as a circle. Um, they provide a structure that's, um, that's centered at the, at the community level. So um, it, while it goes all the way from the federal government down, um, the focus is on community sustainability. And you can see that in, in this second mission statement, which says a secure and resilient nation with the capacity requ capacities required across the whole community to prevent protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the threats and hazards that pose the greatest risk. So quite a nice idea behind it. Next level down, within these frameworks, um, <clears throat> we, they're structured to define the roles and responsibilities of different entities, define the coordinating structures, how the different entities interact with one another, um, guide operational planning at the different levels, and then act as guides and, and resources for state, local, tribal, and territory um, during the, all of the phases of the different re uh, response. It's structured into 15 emergency support functions. That's next level down. Um, emergency support function eight. Um, is public and health medical public health and medical services. So that's where we sit under as as providers, both at the level of uh, of what we do every day and at the level of response. Health and Human Services, one of my employers, um, is the lead agency for uh, for um, emergency support function eight. So it's quite a, a breadth of, uh, of responsibility, and you can see that it goes far beyond clinical medicine um, into things like vector control and, you know, uh, and veterinary response. So you can imagine there's a lot of other agencies that are involved and almost take more of a lead role within each particular uh, entity. But where we are, we have several things within clinical medicine. So behavioral health, patient care, patient evacuation, 
um, management of the materials, management of the personnel. Um, so it's it's quite a, it's quite a large undertaking. Within that structure of ESF eight or emergency support function eight, the action arm or the the people that actually are on the ground doing stuff with regards to clinical medicine is the National Dis Disaster Medical System or NDMS. And that sits under the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR, again, total alphabet soup. I don't know how many acronyms I have on this one page alone. Um, uh, but this is the important piece. This is, this is the action arm and, and uh, where, where my response to events uh, sits under. Um, it's a collaborative between three major organizations. Again, a Department of Health and Human Services, that is the lead agency, but also um, uh, the Department of Defense, veterans of, oh, excuse me, four, four uh, agencies, Department of Defense, um, and I'll talk about that later, um, Veterans Affairs, um, and then Homeland Security. And then the mission statement of NDMS is to provide patient care, patient movement, and definitive care, as well as veterinary services and, and fatal, fatality management. The nice thing here is this definitive care piece. It's great to be an American, right? So this means that the federal government is not going to drop people after the initial phase is over. So this is, um, this is my DMAT team at dawn in Texas. You can see the smoke from the refinery there in the background. Um, it was actually very pleasant getting up at dawn there because it got hot during the day. Um, the three major goals, again, are to, to have a response, a federal response regarding specific clinical care, transport the uh, injured and ill to unaffected healthcare systems across the country, and then provide definitive treatment uh, of injured or ill um, at these other sites. So um, with the last Cascadia Rising drill that we did in Washington State last summer, um, it was estimated that there, were, there would be 65,000 non-ambulatory patients that would require transportation out of the region after that event. So you, you can imagine the scope of an, an event being fairly overwhelming. And that's where, um, that's where entities such as Department of Defense kicks in. Um, so we need their logistics, we need their, their, um, their manpower, or person power, excuse me. Um, so within the MDMS system, there's 6,000 people like me that are part-time intermittent employees. Um, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, there's 8, 000, uh, 1,800 hospital system, which, of which um, all of the UW hospitals are a member of MDMS. And then there's the capacity for 100,000 hospital beds. The unfortunate thing is, given the nature of our current health system in America, there's, there's 110,000 people in those 100,000 beds, um, but we, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, and then uh, the, the main patient care entity is the Disaster Medical Assistance Team or the DMAT team that I'm on and I'll, I'll talk about what that is. So here I am in, um, in Puerto Rico um, in a DMAT uh, field hospital uh, writing a prescription. We wrote um, a ton of prescriptions because the primary care providers weren't around. So we'll talk about that as one of the lessons learned. So the Disaster Medical Assistance Team, or the DMAT team, this is a federally uh, organized entity. It's organ however, it's organized by state and number. Um, go Washington One, that's our team. Um, it's a 50-member team um, and includes uh, logistics, uh, IT, um, EMTs and paramedics, a security person. Um, our, one of our security people is um, actually the same security guy at uh, the Woodland Park Zoo, so that's kind of cool. Um, uh, then nursing, mid-level providers, and providers such as myself. Um, the teams are organized on an on-call basis, so we have several months throughout the year that Washington One is on call. Within that on-call period, which is usually a month, um, we usually say that, okay, I can be available a certain period of time, and we try and take vacation time or, or uh, move our shifts around so that we're available. Um, and then we have the option of saying, okay, I can't, I can't go away that month at all, uh, or saying, okay, I think I'm going to be able to manage that month. And then if we get called up, if we get deployed to an event, um, 
uh, and we quick try and juggle our schedule around and we say, okay, we can go, um, then we become federalized. And that's actually a word. Um, I didn't know what was a word until I prepared this uh, presentation. Um, uh, and then what that means is that I receive orders that are similar to the military um, that say, you know, I must be here and I must do this. Um, and so we sort of, we, we lose our rights as civilians at that point. Um, and then the deployments last days to months. Um, some of the things that I've done is I've gone to CDC um, during the Ebola crisis and, um, and answered the telephones um, as a clinical support person. So, you know, I, I left Seattle. I took took an overnight flight, I get there in the morning and then I'm in the CDC and it's great and I pick up the phone that's ringing and I say, hi, uh, this is the CDC, this is Dr. Morris, I've been an Ebola expert for the last 15 minutes, how can I help you? <laughs> so. Um, and then certainly now with the recovery in, um, in Puerto Rico being so ongoing, we've had people that have been down there for months. Um, so the teams are, were deployed with supporting equipment. So um, this is me eating a meal ready to eat, which actually are, they're generally pretty tasty, although they're very high in salt because they're made for soldiers and they don't want soldiers pooping. So they, they kind of make the, the soldiers constipated. But other than that, they're quite tasty. Um, and you can see these big boxes behind me. So we come with a full cache, um, and this is essentially a fully stocked field hospital. Um, if you think of MASH, um, the old TV show MASH, it really looks quite like that um, with a nicer color tent. Um, uh, and and we, we're supplied by multiple agencies. So you can imagine that the, the chain of, of supply of pharmacy stuff is different from the ch chain of supply uh, for water and for food and for other supplies. So there's a lot of agencies that are involved in keeping one of these field hospitals up and running. Um, and then we have professional security. Um, one thing that uh, that uh, I think the federal government does not um, mess around with is that these are these are unstable environments and and we uh, we don't go into this environment uh, as a group uh, without significant security and safety um, uh, preparations um, so uh, we actually and the when we started off uh, our our uh, tour in um, in Texas um, we were, our security was done by a border patrol, which actually was interesting because it kind of made some people uncomfortable. Um, and then, um, and then it switched to the, um, the National Forest Service Armed Police Force, which, um, uh, was, they were on opposite ends, I think, of the, of the government spectrum there. <laughs> so our, our, um, our motto is the best of care in the worst of times. And we'll actually say this to each other, um, you know, when we're working, like just as a reminder that like, you know, we need to do the best we can. So here I am um, with the cash. Um, I was medical director of my first deployment. Um, and so I was responsible for the meds. I had a pharmacist, thank goodness, uh, UW pharmacist with me, which uh, made things all uh, easier. Um, and interestingly enough, um, you can imagine the expense of this. Um, all of this stuff is generally left into the community um, afterwards um, for a number of reasons. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, millions of dollars worth of equipment that stay in the community that's then been devastated. Switching gears a little bit before I get to lessons learned. Um, there's a few things that we know about specific disasters and disasters in general large body of literature on this. People have studied this um, uh, to, to a large extent. So there's a predictable, predictable element within these, um, which allow someone like me as the clinician uh, or, or manager responding to sort of know what I'm going to get myself into before I arrive on the ground. All disaster events are going to provoke anxiety. They're all going to provoke worsening of chronic disease, which we mentioned, increases in acute illness, um, and that's from an, a large number of things. Whenever you take people out of their house, you put them in large groups, you're going to have increase in infectious disease, respiratory, gastrointestinal, it's, it's a guarantee. Um, so we actually saw a fair number of um, influenza-like illness uh, in, uh, in the shelters uh, in, in Texas. Um, per totally predictable. We know that we're going to have disrupted access to primary care, at least at some level, if nothing else from a transportation standpoint, but, um, but more likely due to, uh, to that part of the healthcare system um, being affected. 
Late presentation of acute disease, this is something that I think we can improve on. Um, I think people are under the assumption that they, um, that's something that wouldn't require them to present um, in the event of a disaster, in, in a non-disaster setting, shouldn't be addressed in a disaster setting. And so we, we end up with these people that are coming in late and, and of course have more complications to their diseases. And I'll mention some of that. So one of the cool things is that we, um, we often go on charter flights or military flights, which means they let you down on a tarmac and put your own luggage um, on the plane yourself, which is so much fun. <laughs> um, with regards to earthquakes, which I've responded to, um, as you saw from my slide from Haiti, um, you know, very predictable, right? Heavy orthopedic injuries um, acutely, um, and then those, of course, you know, orthopedic injuries are not generally are not always uh, treatable in the in uh, the short term. They often require recurrent surgeries and things like that, um, as well as rehab. Uh, we got. Um, uh, a, a large contingent of rehab uh, people down in Haiti um, at about the, the six week mark. Um, crushed injuries and renal failure, we see this in the acute phase. Wounds and infections, you see throughout the entire response. Um, so some of the worst uh, wounds I saw were from people going back into their house trying to get their documents um, and, uh, or money or whatever they needed out of that house that was damaged. Fair number of DVTs and PEs because you have people in a situation where they're non-ambulatory um, and, uh, and we don't necessarily have staff to um, keep them moving around. A lot of exposure related events. Um, it doesn't matter if it's too hot or it's too cold, so you're gonna have some effect on, on healthcare. And then uh, I mentioned the GI and respiratory infections. Do a lot of suturing in these events. Here I am suturing someone with, by flashlight. Um, it's just, uh, something that's very predictable. And our cash actually is, um, is a very well thought through um, hospital, so a hospital cash. So, you know, we have a lot of suture materials. And our, our medication list, I would say as well, is really tailored towards both chronic disease and acute, uh, acute um, presentations. Storms like we saw in Texas, again, pathology clear, uh, drownings. Um, I actually had a, um, uh, I had a patient in Texas who uh, jumped out of his second story window um, and swam two blocks to dry ground. So um, undoubtedly um, quite a dramatic event and luckily he made it. Um, injuries from flying de debris we see in storms, um, a lot of lacerations. Um, a ton of infected wounds. So people, um, their facilities destroyed, they get a wound, even if it's minor, they don't have access to keep that wound clean and then they subsequently have a, a, get an infection. Um, this was doubly worse at, um, uh, after Harvey because um, everybody was walking in water. So if they had a wound really anywhere on their body, you know, on day five, they got infected. And then unfortunately there was some delayed presentation and people came in septic from, from their infected wound. Uh, exposure as well, again, too hot, too cold, um, doesn't matter. Um, I've worked a bit in the, in the um, humanitarian field and civil unrest in and of itself um, is a disaster with predictable um, patterns of, of clinical presentation. So in the acute phase um, uh, and, and farther down the line, you can see things like you know, violent trauma um, and there's certain things that we know about um, populations under stress, um, uh, such as things like domestic violence increase. Um, and so, so those uh, presentations can be increased. Obviously, um, you're dealing with weapons um, and then um, <clears throat> crush injuries from crowds. And then in the long term, you know, malnutrition and uh, lack of access to education and, and um, long term uh, depression and things like that. All right, so we're gonna change. This is our last gear. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, about the uh, hurricanes and, and some lessons we learned. Um, I deployed to two, I deployed to Harvey and, and Maria, but I'll mention something about Irma that was in the middle. This, as you can see, is on the wrong side, but it was the only picture I could find uh, of three hurricanes. Um, in the case of the hurricanes this summer, um, the third one was delayed, so you couldn't get them all on the same picture. Um, you can't talk about hurricanes um, and storms and disaster medicine in America without talking about Katrina. This was a profound 
change in the way we do business. And, um, and I think it was a change uh, for the good. Um, if people haven't read um, uh, the book, uh, Five Days at Memorial, who's written by a colleague of mine, um, uh, it's well worth reading. Um, and it's very well written. Um, so it's an easy read. So what did, we, what did we get out of Katrina? What did we learn from the failures that we had on that? We learned a lot. So we now have all of our agreements and policies in place in advance. That makes it easier, all of these mutual aid, aid um, agreements. Um, so that cuts a lot of the, the uh, red tape. Um, we have a, now a clear uni universally adopted incident command. So police work on an incident command, fire works on an incident command, the hospital works on an incident command, just makes communication much easier. FEMA has poured money into community training. So as, a, as a, an American citizen, you can get free FEMA training where they fly you down to their FEMA base and give you training on disaster management. Um, and, uh, and many in our field have done that. We've made quite, quite strict the disaster-related components of hospital compliance um, and explicit. And this goes from disaster planning requirements all the way to, through to having a disaster, uh, an evacuation plan, um, or how do you deal with outside providers, um, and how do you deal with mutual aid. So there's a lot of pieces to that that have been put in place. Political appointments be gone, uh, so the governor's uncle can't be in charge of disaster management or their cousin or whatever, right? This is a professional field, um, and so um, unfortunately that was a big piece of what happened at Katrina. Better public engagement, so getting, um, getting the public involved and increasing awareness. Um, and then pre-positioned teams, equipment, and supplies. So we now, as a, as a federal entity, we have these, these, um, these better stores and, and, uh, and better uh, supplies, um, and, then, um, and then we're able to pre-position our teams. And in all three of the hurricanes um, that occurred this past uh, fall, we had pre-positioned teams um, uh, that were on the ground during the storm. So 2017 was what they call a hyperactive storm season. Um, and then, uh, so uh, you can see the dark red is category five. We had two of those. Um, and then category four, which, you know, 130 to 156 miles an hour is no joke. Hurricane Harvey, I'll talk about first. So this was a, a, a category four hurricane um, with winds up to 130 miles an hour. Um, it was the first major hurricane to make a landfall since 2005. Um, and it had an interesting pattern where it, it weakened um, when it hit land, but it also stopped moving, which was um, the which resulted in the devastation. So, um, and that was largely related to the rain. Um, so, this was the record in 48 hours of rain uh, recorded um, outside of Houston. Um, so, just to put that in perspective, if it were 20 degrees on the top of Snoqualmie Pass, and you had six, the equivalent of 60 inches of rain, it would be a 75-foot snowfall in 48 hours. So this was a tremendous event. Um, and you can see the devastation. And again, it, it created a, a puddle that was 22,400 square miles. So this was a quote from a patient that I took care of. She said, you know, we've been here before and we'll be here again. So um, uh, I don't know if anyone has read Isaac Storm, but this is a, a book um, by Eric Larson um, that talks about the storm that destroyed Galveston. Um, and it was really the, um, it coincided with the uh, development of the um, uh, National Weather Service um, with regards to a huge public outcry that said we needed, we need to do a better job of predicting these things. And of course, our ability to, um, to predict them uh, has gotten significantly better. Um, this little guy we found outside uh, of one of the tents. Um, we let him go. He was super cute. And then the, um, the uh, charcoal in the back is the, uh, the, the borderland security guys. So they, they weren't required to eat the meals ready to eat. So they would barbecue every night. And so different, different approach. So we were in Port Arthur, Texas, which is a city of about six, 60,000. Um, again, it was heavily flooded. Um, interestingly enough, it's the largest oil refinery in North America, and gas was $2 a gallon when we were there. Um, with regards to the clinical aspects, most of the clinics were closed. Um, uh, and then uh, most of the population with means left. So uh, anyone sort of with wealth in town got out of town because they know that their town had flooded. And the hospitals were up and running, but they were really over capacity. And that was the indication for our team to come in. 
we saw about 500 plus patients um, over the course of a week there. Um, so some clinical lessons learned from Harvey. Um, there were a lot of vulnerable people that were trapped in their homes. So we were having elderly people that were in their homes with water in their homes for five, six days, which I think is really unacceptable. Um, and I think that was a relation that was related to poor communication and also some mixed messages. Some people saying evacuate, some people not. And uh, interestingly enough, I'll talk about it in the, ne in the next hurricane was they didn't make that, that poor communication didn't occur a month later in Irma. They had very strong and sound communication. Um, the primary care providers were slow to reopen. So these are like dock in a box clinics. Um, you know, they're not legally obliged or they're not under requirement to reopen in a certain period. And so they didn't. Um, and that provided this, this uh, real need. Um, and then any situation, these medically complex patients really need to get out. So people with active cancer that are staying in their home when there's a big storm coming just doesn't make sense. Some non-clinical lesson learned. Um, they're saying that the, the, the storm, although it was a horrific storm, was made significantly worse by the built environment. So there's not uh, enough thought process that goes into these, these, um, these rapidly expanding cities with regards to how paving over everything is going to re result in, in uh, complications when there's a storm. Also, building codes. So to quote the patient, we've been here before, so why aren't building codes um, uh, appropriate for places that are known to be flooding? It would significantly make a big significant impact. And we actually saw the houses were all trashed in, um, uh, in Harvey, and then when we were in Puerto Rico, all the houses are not made of sheetrock, but are made of cement blocks, and they did fine. So um, big difference. Um, shelters, we had shelters without generators, it was hot. Um, and then uh, search and rescue pulled resources away from, uh, from other uh, response efforts. And, um, and I think that was the big lesson learned. So we need to message people that EMS, police, and fire may not be able to respond because people have it, that it, it's always there, it's always been there, and I'm gonna pick up the phone when I'm in trouble and there, somebody's gonna come help, right? It's sort of uh, something that we believe in um, uh, at a very fundamental level. And the reality is when a big event occurs, they just cannot respond. We need better community and self-reliance, right? So people in Seattle need to have their house prepared for two weeks in the event of a disaster. And we need to make sure that that happens. There were 17,000 rescues of people in Hurricane Harvey. Um, and that, I say strongly, does not represent a success of search and rescue, right? It represents a failure of us to get those people out of danger's way before it happened. Okay, switching gears um, to Irma. Um, Irma was a category five with winds of 185 miles per hour. We had a, um, a resident in our program that had a Porsche. Um, so if you can imagine, I'm gonna borrow that Porsche. I'm gonna ask one of you to stand on the roof and then I'm gonna drive it at 185 miles an hour just to give you a perspective of what, uh, what an event like that would be. Um, it, is, it was a very, very powerful storm. And uh, to compare it to the, the great hurricane of 1900 that killed 12,000 people, you know, it was much stronger than that. I wasn't there at Irma, but some lessons learned in reviewing the, the press about it. Certainly, we need better controls of our, our nursing homes. Um, there was a terrible tragedy involved there. Uh, and uh, uh, I think um, just like uh, the messaging was really good, so the strong leadership that we saw at Irma immediately after the weak uh, leadership that we saw at Harvey, um, we saw the same thing happen at Maria. So. Um, uh, all of those, those people died tragically in the nursing homes um, at, at Irma, and then Maria happened, and there was, this, there was this push to go out into the community and check out these nursing homes at the federal level. So that, I thought that was good. This idea of geographical bathtubs, so both um, Irma and, uh, and, and uh, Harvey hit places that are extremely vulnerable. And it always brings up the question, you know, do we continue to allow people to expand these communities in these areas that are known to be fraught with, uh, with uh, disaster risk? It's a picture of, uh, of a suture station. Um, 
And I put this up there just to talk a little bit about different providers. Obviously, myself as an emergency medicine physician, um, you know, I've got a lot of the skills that are that are needed um, to. Uh, to respond to these events, such as the suture station here, but that doesn't mean that everyone uh, needs those skills to, to respond. So we had a, a PA um, uh, on our team at Harvey um, who uh, works in the CT um, uh, cardiothoracic surgery department down in Tacoma. Um, and he's worked down there for 15 years. And um, so he was a little sort of nervous about taking care of kids and things like that. And so he'd run cases by me as the medical director and, and, and that was fine and he did great. And he really enjoyed it from a clinical standpoint. But I put this up here because the first day he got here, we're unpacking all the stuff and he made a whole section of chest tubes and, and um, uh, you know, and, and uh, all of the things that he would need to, you know, do his cardiothoracic surgery. And I was thinking, yeah, we're not gonna be doing that much cardiothoracic surgery here in the tent. Um, it's quite funny. So um, the, uh, the, in Puerto Rico, the locals uh, say, they'll say when they're talking about the storm, they'll say, well, you know, when Maria came to visit, which I thought was just kind of a cute way to say things. Um, uh, so it was, a, 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 again, a very serious hurricane and it was a direct hit to several Puerto Rican islands. So this is inside of a grocery store um, at the bread aisle and, a, and it's empty. Um, so here we are in the Caribbean, but actually this is not Hurricane, Met, uh, Hurricane um, Maria, this is Hurricane Mitch. Um, and uh, ironically, it was, um, it was uh, uh, my first federal response. I was in the Forest Service, this was 20 some odd years ago, um, and uh, they sent us down to Puerto Rico. So I was actually, um, Maria was actually my second time going to hurricane response in Puerto Rico, which I thought was really cool. So flying in, you can see the devastation and I had never seen anything like this. So you can imagine driving 50, 100 miles with every single leaf blown off every single plant. It was really dramatic. Um, and the nice thing too is when we left several weeks later, a lot of it had greened up as, uh, as well. That's, uh, that's the capital. So famous picture, so this is, Puerto Rico the night before, um, or the day before the, um, or the night before the hurricane, and, and here it is the night after. They've gotten a lot of bad rep about their infrastructure. Um, so I thought, well, how do we do on the mainlands with our infrastructure? Nationally, we have 55,000 bridges that are structurally deficient. In King County, we have 55. So 55 bridges in King County that would be affected in a storm. With regards to our electrical system, our average power plant is 30 years old and the average transformer is 40 years old. I was unable to find the data from Puget Sound Energy. There was a lot of information out there about all the good things they're doing, fixing the system and modernizing it. But interestingly enough, there wasn't any data on, uh, on the older things. So this is a 40-year-old car, and you can imagine the safety changes that have occurred in 40 years. If we take those same safety changes that occurred within, with regards to electricity and the grid, um, we're really behind the times in updating our, our infrastructure. I put this picture up there because there were, um, there's 185 uh, Burger Kings um, uh, on Puerto Rico, on the main island of Puerto Rico, um, and the day after the storm, Guess how many were open? 185, okay? So we have a lot to learn from the public sector um, in the private sector with regards to being able to manage this. There was a big generator at every Burger King. They had brought supplies in prior to the storm, right? Doesn't take a lot of uh, brain power to, um, to make that happen. And we have done a lot of that in the, at the federal level as well, but we can do better. So here we are uh, the, um, the, at the, um, Convention center. Um, uh, it was the rain was coming so strong it was coming through the roof, and so we took it an opportunity to wash our clothes in the in the bucket. And here we are in a uh, in one of the tents um, prior to uh, the patients coming in for the day. So some lessons learned from Maria: uh, clinically dialysis patients and people that are going to require scheduled interventions should not be allowed to not evacuate. They should be out to a place where we know they're, they're going to be safe and be able to get the, the health care that they need. In particular, I learned that uh, Puerto Rico and then, and then was able to think back that this was an issue in, in, um, uh, at Harvey as well. 
Puerto Rico re relies a lot on um, private uh, individual primary care docs. It, where a lot of them get their primary care is from a doc in their community um, who, uh, you know, takes care of their needs. So these docs flew out. They left prior to the storm, right? Because they had the means and they had family in the United States. Um, so, or, or on the mainland, I should say. Um, so, you know, we need to predict that and be able to support that primary care need. And you, there was one picture of me filling out scripts. And of course, I was filling out scripts for common meds, you know, insulin, uh, antihypertensives. Um, delayed presentations. So we saw a lot of people who, who you know, are tough um, and wouldn't necessarily come to healthcare, but then with the disrupted environment, their wounds got infected and things like that. And, and, and we saw a lot of delayed rep presentations. So getting people to come into the hospital is something that we should be messaging. And then the MDNS system needs to be prepared for a pro prolonged response. And, um, and this, I think, was the major lesson learned. We had three back-to-back -back hurricanes. This is me with my family coming back after being gone for two weeks. Um, we need to think about how we're going to respond as a system um, for a prolonged response phase. Um, we, had, uh, we had real responder fatigue at the level of FEMA all the way down to the level of, of clinicians. Um, and so we need to rethink that process. Um, some of the things that I thought were really salient that showed, uh, showed responder fatigue was we had a, a series of management, uh, management um, people leaving. So the FEMA people, these are people that are, again, mission and, and, and uh, vision driven. Their career is in FEMA and they left in the middle because they were, they were frustrated by the situation. Additionally, what someone said to me was, uh, looking back at the end of, uh, of our second deployment, he said, nobody on the team can look at their actions over the course of these deployments and say that they, they were themselves 100% of the time. So people are going to make bad decisions if you don't have the infrastructure in place um, to uh, provide for a prolonged response. Last lesson learned, don't pick up iguanas. Um, this guy got bitten by an iguana and uh, iguanas are so passive. I'm like, how did you get it bitten by an iguana? And he said, well, I picked it up to try and throw it out of the yard. I'm like, oh. I'm like, come back tomorrow when this is infected. Um, and then I, that's me sleeping outside of one of the tents. Again, it was it was really impressive thing to see. Um, so with regards to research, Resources, if anyone's interested, FEMA has a lot of materials on learning about this. Um, there's a, a Brookings Institute section on this to learn from. And then um, New York Times is sort of the one paper that consistently goes after these issues. Um, and, uh, and that's where Sherry Fink works now. So I think I'm pretty much right on time. I'm all done. Any questions?